this computer. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second lecture on Armenian church history. We're going to be talking about Armenia during the Middle Ages. So this time period is uh, we're going to continue where we left off at the Golden Age. So there's going to be some time jumps and we're going to hit the major uh, markers in the narrative of the Armenian people. So recap from last week, uh, we talked about recap from last week is we talked about um, a Christian culture being established. Uh, that culture uh, was primarily due to the invention of the Armenian alphabet and under the leadership of Sahak, uh, a whole movement was made where scholars, intellectuals were, and missionaries and theologians were brought together to Christianize the Armenian people. And they did this in a time where they were being pulled from the Western Byzantine Empire, which is the continuation of the Roman Empire, and the Persians, or the Sassanid Empire. So in the midst of a, a turmoil where Armenians are living in both multiple spaces, in, in, in the middle of these wars, uh, an identity is emerging that's Christian, Armenian, and it's all due to creating an alphabet, translating the Bible and making sure the culture is uh, all about uh, what's in the Bible. And the big test on this new identity uh, was Vartanans. It was this moment of, are we willing to die for this? And uh, they were, they led a fight, they got brutally killed, but they kept fighting, they kept fighting. And eventually they were able to sign a peace treaty um, where they were able to experience freedom of religion. Uh, one of the early declarations ever on, on something of that nature it went within the uh, Persian Empire. Um, so you would think that the Armenians would be like buddy buddies with the West, but that's not the case either. Uh, one of the main reasons is that is because of the politics of the Roman Empire, which is Byzantine Empire, uh, but also because uh, of the Council of Chalcedon. So the same time, 450, 451, when Armenians were... were fighting for their faith, um, trying to not convert to Zoroastrianism, uh, the first huge major church split takes place. And it's in 451 Council of Chalcedon. It's, it's in Western Turkey today. And it was over how is Jesus divine? How is he fully divine and fully human? Like the Council of Chalcedon said that Jesus is one person with two natures, fully God, fully human. And the Armenians didn't even show up to that council because they were too busy being killed by the Persians. Um, anyway, this leads to a unique Christian perspective, but it sets Armenian history on a trajectory that's gonna be an isolated Christian group in the midst of war in a, in a very difficult geopolitical situation. And yet, despite it all, they're able to kept their, their religion. So let's talk about the ancient city of Devin. Uh, for whatever reason, Armenians love to name their daughters uh, their Armenians are supposed to love their daughters. Did you guys, did you guys see the next slide? People see the slide on the Veen? No. No? Oh, no. Not yet. All right. Let me reshare it then. Have a good night. All right. Now can you see it? Yes. All right. Now you can see me on top of a hill. That hill is uh the hill of Devin. Devin is actually a Persian word for um, hill, apparently. And there's this rural, ruined city you could visit. It's right uh, on the border between Armenia and Turkey. It's by Mount Ararat. Um, when I did missionary work there, I, I got to spend a few days in Artashak, uh, to that area. And we, the, the pastor took us to Devin. And uh, I was checking my phone, probably talking to my wife. And someone took the shot of me on the top of this ancient city where there was uh, multiple Armenian church councils. And uh, the three important ones were um, in the fifth century church where uh, Armenians officially became uh, what is dubbed Oriental Christians. Uh, they rejected the, the decision that God is one person, two natures, or Jesus is one person, two natures. And they were holding on to uh, Mia is like, like another position where, yes, Jesus is one person, but instead of saying he's two different natures and trying to divide Christ, he's just this unique mediated nature. He's a brand new nature. Um, let's call it something else. So 
uh, one of the reasons why uh, the Armenian church was really hesitant to what is Orthodox Christianity in the West uh, is because it sounded too much like an historian Christology, where their position was God is two persons, two natures. Je Jesus is two persons and two natures. And, and the reason why that's bad is because if Jesus is not the bridge between us and God, he has to be this mediator that has both elements. It can't be divided. Uh, there's no salvation if Jesus is not God. There's no salvation if Jesus is not born of the virgin. It, Jesus is this mediator between the earthly and the divine, human and God, humanity and God. So the moment you play with that, the whole Christian system breaks down. Now, I believe the, the monophysite and the neophysite positions is more semantics than anything else. Um, but this is not a theology lesson. This is a history lesson. But it's important to know that in 506, at the count, first Council of Divinity, the Armenian Church, after regrouping from the whole Vartanon's persecution, sided with the Coptics, with the Ethiopians, uh, with the Indian Orthodox, with the Syriac officially to be a separate branch of Christianity that's outside of the Roman Empire, uh, which is now Byzantium. So, so it's important to know the, the geopolitics as well. There's, it's, it, isn't it interesting that it's the, the division is on, on a political boundary. So then the second council of the Divine happens and the Divine is now the, 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 the spiritual center. It's where the Catholic coast resides. And you're gonna see Armenians jumping around to different major cities. Uh, so in 552, the Armenian church starts really creating its church calendar, the, the feast days, the, the liturgy. It, it starts getting more organized, 552 which is interesting. So what's happening from 301 to 552 is not as structured as we think. Um, also, the Third Council and 610 AD, there's some more rejection on Nestorian Christianity. And the funny thing about Nestorian Christianity is Nestorius is this bishop in Constantinople who probably wasn't Nestorius, but they labeled it after him. That's another story for another day. But there was a couple more councils of the Vien, and it's important to know that, or Tavin, if you know someone, um, and uh, it's just important to be aware of that, that these councils were happening during this transitional period as we're gonna go to the Middle Ages. So an important historian, it's kind of meta to talk, to talk about the historians of church history while we talk about church history, uh, Bishop Sebos, uh, I don't know how to say it. Uh, he was a seventh century Armenian historian, writer and chronicler. Uh, he's mainly primary source of the Roman Persian Wars. So again, Armenians are ca caught in the crossfires between these these great empires, and that tends to be our history in a nutshell. He records um, the history of Haigna Habet on until the current day. He continues that legacy of Moses Koronazi that we talked about last week. Um, so while this is happening, there's these royal families that are important uh, that go back to Gregory the Illuminator. And one of the main ones is the uh, Pak, uh, Pakraduni or Pakruduni uh, dynasty. And they reign from 1880, uh, 885 to 1045. At this point, you have the rise of Islam and the Arab conquest. Um, but that, as that Arab conquest is declining in the region, this, this, this kingdom emerges. Uh, and it, the, the people, this uh, family was already around, but, but they started to take power. Um, so uh, the sad thing is there was other smaller families with their own little kingdoms. And just like today, you're wondering if Armenians were united, they could do so much more. Same problem back then. They, they weren't completely united. Um, uh, also, during this time, the city of power transitions from Devin to Ani. Again, another very common Armenian girl's name. Uh, it's known to be the city of a thousand and one churches, which is probably not the case unless they did a house church thing. <laughs> but there was a lot of churches in the region. And uh, it was the seat of the power for the Catholicos. Uh, sadly, right now, in it, uh, there needs to be a lot more excavation in the city of Ani. It's right across the, the border. If you you could see the city of Ani if you're at Korvirov, it's it's in a distance. It's this ruined area, um, and there's a sign in Turkish right now that says Armenians were the ones responsible for burning down Ani. Um, well, in reality, it was conquered by the Byzantines, the Seljuk Turks. And Tamerlane came and completely like annihilated this in 3, 1380. It was a multi-ethnic community. It wasn't just like a bunch of Armenians. It was a, it was a very um, cosmopolitan, very uh, profound city. Um, 
but it's no longer in power. My, I have a good friend of mine. He, he writes historical fantasy and he, one of his drafts of his book is about the fall of Ani. And, and he, he, he knows more about Ani than I do. And he's not an Amer- Armenian. Um, it was more, not just one ethnic group. You had different ethnic groups, but it was, it was this, this center of uh, Armenian culture and identity uh, during this dynasty. And notice that the flag of this family crest is like the, the Puma sign. It's pretty cool. <laughs> um, anyway, side story. So during this time, uh, church doctor Gregory of Nadek uh, is doing his thing. Uh, he's a mystic. He's a liter- lyrical poet. He's a monastic monk. Uh, he helps write Sharagans and kind of helps the, the musical tradition of the, of the liturgy. Uh, he's known for writing the Book of Lamentations, this book of prayers. You can see them online. He does a lot of like uh, uh, writing his prayers like with the alphabet A, B, C, like A, and the, he begins with A, B, begins with B. Um, he also wrote a commentary on the Song, song of Solomon, which, I mean, which is interesting. Uh, he became a Koikos later in life. Um, his nephew I think, took the reins after him. Uh, and the cool thing about him is in 2015, seven years ago, Pope Francis, one of his early moves as the Pope was he made him a church doctor, which is like unheard of because going back to these splits, this is the first time a Catholic person is acknowledging not just him being a saint, but a church doctor, which is usually held for people within that church um, tradition. So that, that was a huge ecumenical move, a very cool move that happened um, seven years ago. And all my uh, Catholic friends from uh, St. Lazarus Island and the, the, the Catholic community in Venice, they were there for that service. I remember watching them and seeing my, my friends uh, participate in this, this acknowledgement seven years ago. Um, very cool stuff. So he was a big, important figure. Um, but there's also different fringe Christian groups in the Armenian community at this point which I think is very fascinating. Um, the, the thing about history, it's written by the winners. So like, for example, the Lutherans, did, Martin Luther didn't want his movement to be called Lutheran. He wanted his people to be called evangelicals. But the, the, the Catholics at the time were like, all right, we're gonna call you Lutherans. So the Paulicians, they're a weird group. We don't know too much about them. They're the, they call themselves good Christians or true believers, and they refer to the Orthodox Apostolic Mother Church as Romanist. Fascinating. They're very revolutionary in their thinking. They're more egalitarian. But we don't know what they believe. We don't know if they were full-on heretics. Uh, they're often accused of being dualistic, kind of taking in some of these um, Nestorian, not Nestorian, Nestorian belief, Zoroastrian belief into the Christian thought. Um, they were also accused of adoptionism, which is uh, Christ really takes on his divinity at his baptism. He wasn't born of the virgin. But again, it's hard to know what they really believe. They're just speculation. Um, but one thing was is very interesting, the, and the historians are known for this. Uh, they did not like to call Mary the mother of God. Interesting. And an offshoot of the pa- pa- Paulicians. Um, who, who they think is connected to this movement is called the uh, Tandrakian. Uh, and they were around from the 9th century to the 11th century. And the only reason we really know about what they believe was because St. Um, uh, Gregory of Nautic has a whole section condemning them. But look what he condemns them for. <laughs> and you're wondering, wait a minute, this sounds very familiar as a Protestant. Uh, the rejection of priestly ordination, Rejection of baptism as a means of cleansing original sin. Did not accept marriage as a sacrament. Refused to venerate the cross. And they didn't like kneeling in worship, apparently. Interesting. And now, I don't know what they really believed. But, but it, it is fascinating that some of the tendencies that they, that they were uh, refuted were stuff that Protestants later would refute too. Um, so, fast, these groups were around. It's not like, because it's not just like, all of a sudden, Protestant thinking people just emerged only 500 years ago, or in the Armenian tradition, 250 years ago. Um, I feel like the spirit's always at work. It's just how do you chronicle it? And I and these two groups could be purely heretical. I have no idea. I'm just saying, like as we we don't know that much. Um, they could be not worshiping Jesus properly. I don't know. Um, 
or it could be more of a mixed bag, which is probably the case, which is the mixed bag most of the time. But it's important to be aware of this. This is part of history. These groups are purely Armenian um, in, in, their, in their origins. Um, and yeah, maybe they are heretical, or super heretical, and we should be glad that they just stopped existing. But I don't know. We don't know the exact details. But it's interesting to critique on the uh, Tondrakians, at least. Um, so another important sidebar, before we jump into Western Armenia and the Kingdom of Cilicia officially, the church had its great schism in 1054. And the theological disputes were over the power of the pope starting to accumulate too much church power. And also uh, the philoquial clause, which added the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, not just, just the Father. So there was a the theological debate. Again, this is not a theology lesson, but it's important to know the theological reasons. But the real split happened during the Fourth Crusade, um, where the Venetians, instead of trying to reclaim uh, Jerusalem, they, they sacked Constantinople. They were attacking each other. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why that happened. But that really is the, 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 the official marker when the, they're fighting head on like that, that led to a great schism. And this is very tragic. So what this leads to is you have the Catholics in the West, you have the Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox in the middle, and then you have the Oriental Orthodox on the fringe. And while the church is divided, you're gonna have Mongolian invasion, the rise of the Turks, the, the, a lot of conquest, but the real sadness is the Christians who claim to be Christians aren't getting along. And that's history for you. Um, so now with that said, just know this is happening in the backdrop. While Armenia develops a kingdom in what is Galicia, Western Armenia. Many of our ancestors are from these towns. Um, my family is from Aintab. It's part of this kingdom. Uh, also, my family is from Madash, right there. Um, if you're from Adana, if you're from uh, these regions, which you probably are, it's connected to what's going to happen. And the interesting thing is, it's not like ethnic groups just stayed to their little border territories. Borders weren't really a thing. People migrated to cities. People moved to where commerce was, where business was back then, just as they do today. Um, and you have your early settlement of Armenians in this land going back to Tigran the Great. He had a really big empire that was short-lived um, from, from 140 to 55 BC, right before Jesus was, arrives on the scene. You have Armenian, uh, an Armenian empire. This was our last like big empire where we were expansive in nature. Um, the, um, so you have Armenians living in these mountains, living in these regions from then but the the the, the people start becoming um their own self is through rupen the first uh he led a revolt against byzantine rule and declared cilicia independent state and began the rupenian dynasty officially beginning western armenia and know that it's a principality at this point from 1080 to 11 uh, uh 1198 it's not officially a kingdom yet um and then during this time you have the first crusades. And throughout this period, there's infighting with Byzantines. Sadly, that's the case throughout the history. Uh, but you also have some collaborations uh, where crusaders stop by Armenia and, and, uh, and then they go to the Holy Land. It's like, a, it's like a pit stop on the way. And the, there's records of like crusaders talking about how beautiful our women are. And like, it's great, it's true. Like even back then, before Kim Kardashian, there was, there was these accounts of our people and whatnot. Um, so, so then you have, uh, during this period too, uh, a strong relationship with France, especially in the Third Crusade with the House of, uh, with the French um, uh, people, because they have a strong hold in, 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 in Cyprus. Um, and there's a lot of intermarriages, political marriages, pol political betrayal during this time. It's very Game of Thrones because it's history. There's a lot of intrigue and whatnot um, that I would love to get into, but I need to learn it more. But it's definitely like 
people are upset that this person took their throne. People are marrying this person to establish power and to establish alliances. That's all happening during this period of history. And uh, there's a reason why there's an O and F at the end of the alphabet because of French words. <laughs> like there was added later. Oh, the off was added later. Um, and you have words like baron, baron, uh, like French terms is, are, are being used and Armenia, Western Armenia begins to, to, to learn from France and France learns from Armenia. There's this back and forth going on. Um, a cool nugget of history during the third crusade, um, Armenians allied with King Richard the Lionheart and King Philip, uh, they prevent Salah Hadin from invading uh, Cilicia. Cool, fascinating stuff right there. And this principality officially becomes a kingdom in around 1198 uh, or 99, when Baron Levon II becomes coronated uh, as King Levon I at the Church of the Holy Wisdom at Tarsus on Armenian Christmas. Now, the way it works is to be king, other kings have to acknowledge you as king. And there's a whole like political convoluted story about how he finally got uh, 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 other kings to acknowledge him as king. Um, so that's why it was a principality before it became a kingdom. And when it became a kingdom, it's because uh, with the help of the Crusades, with some alliances, with some marriages, this and that, eventually got to a point where um, Levon was granted the title as king and the Western Armenian kingdom was established. So after King Levon dies, um, he doesn't have any heirs, he, except for a three-year-old daughter, Zabel. So Zabel becomes queen, and he eventually marries King Hectum. Actually, she's actually married to someone else, but then like King Hectum's dad is upset about it. I think they kill him, and then King Hectum marries Zabel, and he becomes King Hectum. And Hectum is actually a phenomenal, fascinating person. Um, he's aware of the danger of the Mongolian Empire, like just steamrolling through um, the, the, the Western world. So him and his brother travel 4,000 miles during his reign, a seven-month journey, one way, to speak with the Khan at Karakrum. And their objective is to convert the Khan to Christianity and create an alliance. Think about how crazy that sounds. It's like, um, it's like the king of, it's like the, it's like uh, Nicole Pashinyan going to Saudi Arabia to convert uh, the, 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 the king of Saudi Arabia. That, like, that's what's happening right now, but like even bigger. And uh, he fails in his attempt to convert the, king, uh, the, the Khan. And, um, but, it, it buys Armenia some time not to get invaded right away by the Mongols. There, there, there's this favor, at least, um, that, that, that he creates. He creates some sort of peace treaty. It gets broken down the line. There's, there's more history down the line, but at least he's able to keep peace for a long period of time. Um, just imagine, like, this journey. And the only reason we know a lot about the journey is because his brother wrote about it, like Marco Polo style. Like, they just wrote about this, this trek. Um, and then later in King Hectum's reign, uh, he retires as king. Like, that's also very rare. Like, he's like, ah, you know what? My time is up. And he gives the power to his other son, King Leo. I don't know which number we're at right now. And uh, then he lives the rest of his life as a monk. Um, so, yeah. And there's a lot of, like, Armenian princesses and queens that run Jerusalem, that are part of Cy uh, uh, Cyprus, and even Armenian descendants within the Byzantine Empire through political marriages. So Armenian has royalty in these cities. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of overlap. And Armenians were like in places like Jerusalem uh, right from the beginning. Um, and I'm sure Seza could, could teach us more on that. So, so just know that there's these political alliances, allegiances, politics, infighting, um, people fighting for power, nothing really has changed in that, in that front. So what, what is the legacy of Western Armenia as we're wrapping up? Um, the main thing is like Armenia became a middleman in the trade, a bridge between the East and the West. I think we still have that edge. We could get Eastern cultures, Western cultures. Um, 
and the Silk Road is here. So we we also because we are able to expand west, we have access to the ports. Uh, Galicia, if you notice, is is around the Mediterranean. Um, uh, Marco Polo, if you read his stuff, he talked about Armenians. Um, also, during this period, you have educational development. A monastic movement um, is kind of strengthened. And monasticism kind of being an intellectual hub of the people. Uh, you have Nikitar Gosh, the different narcissists, uh, preserving Armenian uh, culture, history, and uh, writing spiritual stuff, which is what we're known for. Um, also, the cities of Galicia were very uh, cosmopolitan. Cis is the, the, the main city. You go from Davin to Ani to Cis. Um, these are kind of major hubs of, 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 of the civilization. Again, there's that integration of French culture, which is sounds random, but it's, it's not if you think about the Crusades. Uh, also, the architecture was pretty uh, well thought out. We have a lot of good architects in our culture. We have intellectualism in our culture, innovators in our culture. Um, and the sad thing about it is this is a short-lived kingdom relatively, and it's our last kingdom. After this point, um, the, there's going to be infighting and whatnot, but it's uh, they lose ground to um, other uh, groups. But eventually, the Mongols, I mean, the, the Ottomans take over, and we're going to start um, next week's lecture on what does it mean to be part of the Ottoman Empire moving forward. So, so this is the legacy of Western Armenia. Um, and again, most of the diasporans, uh, from our churches tend to be from Western Armenia um, because they're the ones who uh, ex experience the genocide. If, if you look at the genocide primarily, it's it's Western um, Armenians' villages that get completely wiped out. But you have Armenians living in these ran these these areas from the time of Jesus. Um, so just to put that in perspective. So that's it. So I'm going to pause this lecture. Um, for those listening online, thank you. Um, we're going to now do Q&A with the group we have here. So let's talk.